So, so then moving on to give you more of an overview of the genomic medicine working group, which was, which was the, sort of the grandparent of this particular uh, effort now, now telling you about a, a working group of you. Um, so the advisory council has two major working groups that I'm aware of. One of them you just heard from before lunch and now this one. Um, and just to remind you who is on it, um, so this is the, the group. Um, and then Eric and, and Laura and I are sort of the ex officio folks from NHGRI. Okay. Um, the, uh, the GMWG was set up uh, about four years ago, shortly after the, the strategic plan was released, uh, to help us in charting this area, uh, particularly uh, to evaluate and implement genomic medicine and review progress, identify research gaps, identify and publicize key advances. Um, we decided we needed a series of meetings. Uh, we actually weren't sure it was going to be a series, but we knew we needed at least one um, and figured there probably would be others uh, to help us explore this area and also learn who is doing this work, bring them together and form, you know, more of a community uh, of effort, uh, facilitate collaborations and explore models for uh, long-term inf infrastructure and sustainability. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've planned a series of meetings. These first three uh, were in, in uh, rapid succession. Uh, in the, the first uh, year or so after the, the strategic plan was released. And again, mainly to kind of develop collaborations and, and get people aware of what each, what each other was doing and not duplicate what each other was doing because there was a fair amount of, of siloing and, and duplication. Um, our fourth meeting was, was focused specifically on physician education because I think everybody recognized that uh, that, that was an area that needed to be addressed. Uh, our fifth was trying to develop federal strategies. That was one that uh, the gentleman you're going to hear from next uh, managed to make it to for a short period. Uh, and and uh, really asking our, our other agencies uh, what, what should we be doing together in, in implementing genomic medicine. Uh, the global leaders meeting that I mentioned to you previously, and in October we held one um, on genomic clinical decision support, uh, and the report for that has, uh, has gone in for, for publication. And then this uh, most recent one in June was a really kind of an overview. So the working group members said, you know, something that would be very helpful would be for us to take a step back and look at all of the programs all together and see how they fit together, where they could fit together better, um, and, and what the gaps might be. Um, and just to kind of give you a feel for what's come out of these meetings, so our first meeting actually led to a, a separate workshop a few months later uh, that we called Clin Action, and from that, the Clinical Genome Resource. Uh, or the ClinGen uh, uh, was born, and so that was a, a kind of a direct descendant, basically, of that first meeting where people were saying, you know, we've got all these variants, we don't know what they mean, we, we all sit down in a room and try and hash it out, and, and it seemed to us that if people were doing that in separate rooms in, in 20 or 30 or 100 places around the country that we could organize and coordinate that effort and get it done much faster. Um, the Emerge Pharmacogenetic uh, effort also came in, in large part out of the, uh, uh, that first meeting where we recognized that pharmacogenetics was a ripe area and that we could uh, uh, be working in one of our large consortia to be able to, to implement it rapidly. Um, our second meeting uh, was on collaborations and that led to our Ignite program where we really are trying to uh, take um, uh, centers that are expert in this area and, and, and then try to have them disseminate to, area, to, to centers that really don't do genomics at all. So family health clinics, uh, community health centers, um, uh, military, VA, uh, other, other kinds of places. Um, our third meeting um, involved payers. We really wanted to, to work with payers to understand what kind of evidence they needed in order to be able to support this kind of uh, uh, reimbursement for these kinds of tests. Um, our fourth uh, led to the, on, on education, led to the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee that you've heard about a few times uh, since at this meeting. Um, and the fifth one, uh, I have dotted lines here, not because I, because I didn't want to imply that our fifth meeting produced CMS, FDA, or the, or the Air Force, but, but what they, heaven knows, um, what they did produce were, were closer collaborations with those groups um, in looking at, at ways that we can, we can um, uh, share information and, and uh, collaborate to improve implementation where it's appropriate, um, not just willy-nilly. Um, the um, fifth one also led to a an, an, uh, trans-NIH working group within NIH. Uh, this is something we discussed with the institute uh, leaders uh, at one of their uh, strategic planning forums. And, uh, and they basically said, you know, we need to al also know, everybody needs to know what's going on within NIH. And it was that group that we drew from when we put together the uh, SGS-10 uh, planning group. Um, our sixth meeting, which was the global leaders meeting, led to a global consortium called the Global Genomic Medicine Consortium, or G2MC. It is jointly hosted with the Institute of Medicine, and it will have another meeting 
in Singapore um, in November. And there are a series of areas that, that uh, groups are, are collaborating in uh, and also working with the Global Alliance uh, for Genomics and Health, which is much more of a research effort, this more of an implementation effort. Uh, you've heard about that before, so I won't go into it uh, much with limited time. Uh, but out of that uh, group came the SGS-10 meeting that you just heard about. Um, our seventh meeting in um, uh, clinical decision support led to a much stronger collaboration with the Institute of Medicine Genomics Roundtable. And there's, uh, there was kind of a plan hatched for a uh, soup to nuts program in genomics clinical decision support at our meeting that is now being implemented in the, in the genomics roundtable. So that's very exciting. Um, and then uh, our eighth meeting uh, was just held in June. Uh, the objectives of it were, as, as often is, kind of where are we, where are we going uh, sort of meeting. So um, uh, reviewing our portfolio, identifying gaps, identifying related programs for, uh, among other centers and ways that we could work together, uh, research needs um, for ourselves and our partner agencies to pursue. Um, and then we always try, and one of the reasons that we do these programs as large collaborative programs is that they can have an impact on a field and sort of pushing it forward or pushing it in a direction that, that no single investigator can have um, by themselves, no matter how good they are. Um, and then examine potential methods for uh, assessing uh, the impact of these programs. So we decided to, to kind of focus on the, the six programs that are the major genomic medicine uh, portfolio. Uh, Parson, you've heard these described before, so I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, about them, but they're, they're here, um, and, and our undiagnosed diseases, newborn screening, clinical sequencing, uh, eMERGE, um, the IGNITE program and dissemination, and then the ClinGen uh, resource. And then we also had a series of related programs that we wanted to hear from and have members in the room, um, you know, some of them in, in the very basic, uh, basic realms, some in informatics, as you, as you see here with GSIT, ENCODE was there. Um, uh, representatives from the ILM roundtable, some from the MCI clinical trials that are genomically driven, et cetera. So, uh, so a large number that we tried to bring together and see where we had the joint opportunities. And then we asked for, for summaries from each of them. This is one from the clinical genome resource. Uh, it's basically a summary that describes, you know, who's, who's involved, what the mission or the objectives are. Here's another one for uh, newborn sequencing, a uh, third one for the Centers of Mendelian Genomics. Um, and in these, we, we asked for just two pages to describe the objectives, you know, what, what the funding period is, the working groups, the resources and tools that they've produced, publications, um, obstacles, and then approaches to meet those, those obstacles. And all of those are, are uh, stored and available on the website for this meeting, which if you search Genomic Medicine 8, or if you just go to Genomic Medicine Activities, the, the website for the meeting will come up, and then you can find these meeting summaries. And we're, we're still referring back to them. They're very useful to have. Um, one of the things we asked them to do, as I mentioned, was to identify their objectives. And then we kind of looked across them to see, well, you know, what are objectives, particularly in the focus programs, that are really quite common um, across them? Because we would expect them to have some that would be in common. And as you might expect, these are, are very closely aligned with the goals of, of our division and the goals that the Genomic Medicine Working Group has outlined for itself. Uh, so integrating genomic data into patient care, incorporating actionable, var actionable variants into the electronic medical record, particularly with using clinical decision support, educating clinicians and patients, assessing the outcomes, um, defining and sharing how best to do this in, in best practices, promoting interactions and collaborations, uh, translating implementation outside highly specialized centers. And, and while this is Ignite's special role, actually several of the programs are, are doing this currently. There were also some that were, were pretty much targeted or, or unique to a, a given program. So uh, the UDN uh, is, is very heavily emphasizing uh, improving genomic diagnosis and facilitating research in, in undiagnosed diseases. But Insight and Caesar do a little bit of that kind of work as well. Um, only Insight is looking at in newborn care. Uh, electronic phenotypes are something that is unique to eMERGE but is needed by all of these programs, really. Uh, identifying variants related to complex traits are, are shown in a, a few of them as well. Pharmacogenetics is pretty much the uh, um, uh, domain of eMERGE and IGNITE. Uh, looking at penetrance is pretty much uh, eMERGE alone. Standardizing clinical annotation, assessing actionability uh, um, with uh, mainly Insight and ClinGen, and then creating a, a sort of genomics-enabled learning healthcare systems where we can actually improve care in a, uh, a real-time way, uh, something that CSER, eMERGE, and IGNITE are really focusing on. And we also identified barriers that face multiple programs. Lack of an evidence base was one we knew four years ago. It's one we have now, and it's probably one that will be with us for, for as long as we're in this area. 
Um, the need for common data elements came up uh, repeatedly as something that we want to, to try to encourage across the programs. Um, assessing the frequency and impact of variants, particularly in ancestrally diverse populations, um, uh, something that is, is a particular problem. And as, as Eric mentioned uh, earlier today, that, that Bence had an entire workshop on uh, focusing specifically on, on why is it so hard to get information in ancestrally diverse populations when we must have it. Um, rapid evolution of evidence in, on uh, uh, variants. So how do you deal with the changing levels of evidence? A, a variant that you thought yesterday was benign, now a report comes out and it looks like, oh, it might not be so benign. And then a few more reports come out and, well, gee, it's pretty clearly pathogenic. How do you deal with that in, in relating to patients and clinicians? Um, the uh, current limited usefulness and interoperability of clinical decision support systems. So you build it in, in one hospital system and it works, in, hopefully, in that one hospital system but nowhere else. Uh, regulations that impede return of results have, have really gotten in our way in, in many ways with the, the research efforts that we're doing. And we're working with, um, with our colleagues in the regulatory field to try to address those, but that's going very slowly and they are, it is having an impact both on the research and the clinical care. Need for cloud computing is, is growing as the sequence um, uh, data grow. Uh, so, so does the need for uh, better ways to manipulate the data and transfer it to move it around uh, when needed. Uh, reimbursement policies and regulations I mentioned earlier, I think, and, and in pr a particular need for uh, uh, bedside back-to-bench research. So how can we stimulate that, that virtuous cycle where we find something at the bedside and can take it uh, back and really investigate it? Um, we set up a, a series of panels. Uh, these were the, the panel areas, and we asked them to, to then uh, address a, a number of questions. How important is this topic in this area? Um, what programs do we have addressing it? What are the gaps? What could be the synergies and the training opportunities? And then we, we asked each of the genomic medicine working group members to, to lead one of those and very much appreciated their efforts in, in doing that. Um, there were a series of, of recommendations that, that got a lot of discussion. Uh, maybe heavily discussed is a, is a little too strong, but, um, but I, I tried to pull out those that, that seem to be uh, recurring just to, to kind of share them with you. And again, sorry not to have gotten these out to you sooner. They are in the report, um, and we'll, we'll post these slides so that if you want to refer back, you'll have them. Um, but generating evidence was, was an area that uh, everybody agreed was something we needed to, to do much more of. Uh, data sharing and improved phenotyping, particularly standards for phenotype description that you could use from model organisms to humans so that you can go back to the, the, to the bench um, when you've seen something at the bedside. Uh, a lot of interest in patient-oriented ontologies, so ways that patients can enter information on what their child has or what they have, what their symptoms might be, and that, that could still be um, in, in, uh, translatable in ways that cases could be picked up around the world um, uh, and linked together. Identifying and carrying out innovative studies, uh, particularly engaging basic scientists more actively in, in planning our programs because we don't have uh, that voice at the table very often when we have it at this table. Um, but uh, we need you to speak up more in terms of how we can do the science better. Um, an, an interesting idea was to add family history to a large-scale sequencing effort so that we, could, we might end up with 20,000 people who had both a, a rigorous family history, not, not an, you know, one that that took weeks to put together, but, uh, but something using some of the more uh, up-to-date software tools that can be done relatively rapidly. But if you had that on 20,000 people with their sequence information, imagine what you could learn about the added value of family history and, and how you need family history information to interpret, uh, particularly in rare sequence variants. Uh, studying the impact and consequences of changes in variant annotation, uh, facilitating implementation. Uh, uh, implementation commons was something that was, was very attractive to a number of the groups putting tools into a common place where people could then uh, use them and, and uh, share their, their experience in using them. Uh, health disparities, and again, um, we, we discussed some of these last week and you'll be hearing about them more, um, but looking at, at specific health disparities research questions related to genomics and implementation, um, developing dedicated programs for non-European ancestry populations and increasing patient engagement, uh, education and training is, is always an area that is needed. Um, and potentially joint training opportunities or, or best practices for clinician education. Um, one of the things that we did with this meeting uh, was to take, we had about 50 recommendations, and we thought, well, why don't we ask people to sort of tell us what their top 10 is? Um, so from the ones that I, sh I showed, pulled out about 20 of them to, to report to you, but, but we then, um, through our, uh, we, Duke University was working with us on this um, um, workshop, and so they sent out a little survey and said, just tell us what your top 10 are and rank them, you know, from 1 to 10. And then we kind of averaged those just to see which, which were those that, uh, that tended to, to come to the top. And you'll notice that, uh, that up here there are a couple that are really, you know, quite popular, and then there's maybe a little bit more of a shelf down here at 10 or 11. So. 
So I just pulled these out to show you um, what the, the top ones were. Um, and the top number one was measuring outcomes of value to patients, clinicians, payers, and then a whole list of other stakeholders. Um, so, so regulators, et cetera, et cetera. You know, how can we learn what outcomes are important to these groups so that we can add them to our studies? It couldn't, it might not be very difficult to do uh, and produce information that is much more useful to them. The family history tool came in second, so it's at uh, 3.5. Identifying types of evidence to collect and share across programs, accelerate rapid uh, genotype phenotype explorations. One of the big concerns was that a lot of these explorations take a very long time, and if you have a sick baby in the, in the neonatal intensive care unit or if you have someone else who is really quite desperately ill, you don't want that process to take months or years. Um, suggestion was made to consider cooperative sequencing groups to gather information uh, about sequencing, much like the cooperative oncology groups that the NCI has funded at the, you know, basically the budget of this institute many, many times over <laughs> per year. So we couldn't do anything quite that grand, but at least something to consider. Um, and then a, a number of others that I, I just sort of show here, facilitating coverage through evidence development, identifying payers' needs, something that, that we are really struggling with. You know, what is it that payers really want to see? Not that we're trying to get everybody to pay for these things. We, we want to understand what is appropriate to be paid and what, and what isn't. And so how can we, we learn what evidence to generate for that? Um, Post-marketing studies, um, similar to uh, our pharmacovigilance studies, but for genetic testing. So can you, can you kind of gather information from people who've had genetic tests on what, the out, what their outcomes are and how they use that information? Um, some agreed upon nomenclature, um, variant definitions and allelic identifiers that will help us with um, some of the, the um, uh, trading information back and forth, like the pharmacogenetic star allele system, which is very cumbersome and very difficult to work with. Uh, HLA is another area where nomenclature is a, is a major challenge, but are there other ways to, to work on that? Uh, computable guidelines um, to put into clinical decision support systems, uh, clinical trials of the added value of whole genome sequencing to more limited testing. So uh, the question that we're doing in, in eMERGE right now, we, we can afford basically a, a hundred gene panel. And if we did a whole genome sequence you know, and compared it, what would be the, the risks and the benefits? You might identify a whole bunch of stuff you don't know what to do with and you just run up costs without any added benefit. On the other hand, you might find somebody who's at risk for carbamazepine toxicity that you didn't know, and they might be you know, about to get that or a related drug. Um, so our plans for uh, follow-up immediately are to engage basic scientists. This, was, this came up over and over. We, we need basic scientists at the table and involved in, in developing our programs. Um, so, so, you know, we've, we've had uh, a lot of emphasis on this sort of pathway from the, from the bench to the bedside, and we really need to, to go back um, and, and be sure that the function is explored and other things are explored in the laboratory. Areas that, that seemed like they would benefit from this included phenotyping um, uh, that was compatible with model organisms to promote that kind of research. Uh, variant uh, nomenclature was one function um, uh, to help us with uh, clinical annotation. So those are the things that we are, are going to pursue, um, and that will be the, sort of the focus of our ninth meeting, uh, which will be held next April. Um, Pursuing infrastructure needs, there, there were a lot of suggestions that were really kind of infrastructural, um, developed knowledge bases of what's going on in genomic medicine, uh, a variety of other things, the implementation commons, common data elements. Uh, those are things we're going to have to struggle with a bit because it, it, they don't really seem to lend themselves necessarily, and we would, would welcome your advice, uh, to funding opportunities where we say somebody, you know, develop common data elements or increase patient en engagement in that, but they're things we need to think about a bit. And then comparative effectiveness research, I, I may have put this on in the anticipating the, the next talk to come, um, but we, we did hear uh, one, something that would be very useful would be uh, whole genome sequencing versus targeted panels. Another would be whole genome sequencing with or without um, uh, family history in large enough numbers to be able to, to draw some conclusions. Um, so these are the people that were involved in putting this together, and many thanks to them. And then back to you. Um, so we would welcome your comments on our, our recent activities and, and advice on the priorities that we've, we've outlined. Um, and I've asked uh, Carol Bolt and uh, Howard Jacob to comment. Carol, do you want to go first? So of course, these are all very broad-ranging, giant areas of, of activity that, that were discussed and outlined, especially at the last um, genomic medicine meeting. Um, and, and I'm, we've talked a little bit on our phone calls about, you know, how to how we can most effectively work together to move forward genomic medicine, and and I think that um, 
I think there's a, a number of things in the priorities that came out, and, and we're still discussing whether those are the right priorities. So really interested in people's comments about whether or not they feel like the ones that came out of the survey, which I forget, Terry, how many people responded it to the survey? It was a small number. So we had about yeah. 88 at the, at the meeting and 35 responded. Yeah, and that's, that's always a, a challenge, right? We, we hold these meetings, and then you ask for feedback, and you get feedback from a very small number of people, and that ends up being your recommendations and priorities. So part of the benefit of bringing it out to the group like this is to, you know, is that a biased sense? Is, that, is there general agreement with these, these priorities or not? Um, and just with respect to uh, the planning for, for GM9, you want me to comment on that Please as do. well? So the so the as Terry said, the uh, one of the themes that emerged a number of times during GM eight was this integration of basic science um, and how that can effectively promote and advance genomic medicine. And um, you know, it goes back to what Eric was saying earlier this morning about the fact that you know we have all these fun all these variants come out of these genome sequencing projects, and we don't know their their biology. We don't know what they do. And to effectively integrate that information into genomic medicine, we have to functionalize them. Um, and so this virtuous cycle that Terry uh, had the slide on, that we, we want GM9 to kind of focus on that virtuous cycle. Um, how can we better integrate, especially the arc that goes from the patients back uh, into the, the model organisms and how we develop the models themselves, right? When we talk about models, that means so many different things to so many different people. And in even being able to communicate effectively about what a model is and what it means um, is important to do. So that's going to be, currently, that's going to be our focus for GM, GM9. Um, Howard? Howard, did you want yeah, to Yeah, so, so I, think that's a, I think that's a great summary. Um, I would only add uh, one additional point to what uh, Terry and, uh, and Carol have mentioned, and that is that connection at the basic research level um, it, it, we need to also be able to do it, and Terry did say this, but we have to do this much, much faster uh, because as we're doing more and more of this clinical sequencing, you know, it's right at the edge of care slash research, um, and we're finding these variants of uncertain significance. So, so not only do we need to think how to functionalize it, but how do we do this fast enough to, pr to provide information back to the patient uh, or to the physician in order to try to uh, affect care? So that's all I had to add, but I, I thought it was a good summary. Great. Thank you. Comments from the group? I, I, I just would echo what Carol said. I mean, I, I think that uh, we've spent a, a, a lot, GM 1 through 8 on sort of looking at other communities. And, and as we were planning for GM 9, we said, well, there's one community that we really haven't engaged, and that's our basic science colleagues. And everybody around this table, from the most clinical to the most basic, recognizes that. That the potential for that virtuous cycle, functionalizing, I like that word, uh, variants of uncertain significance is a huge problem. And there are many, many other, uh, I'm sure, uh, opportunities that the clinical data sets that we're generating should offer to the basic scientists. And there are other things that basic science should be offering to us besides just function telling us whether a, a particular SNP is functional or not. And that's why we have to have that. Interchange. Yeah, just that uh, this this it's a great comment, and this goes back to what I was talking about in terms of a model. So we're used we're used to thinking about models of, of understanding the basic biology, but there's also model systems to look at at therapy outcomes, right? And so those those can be completely different models, and but we we tend to lump them all under the same thing. And I think this meeting could help us start to tease some of those things apart, so that there's really good communication. And I, I might note that, that uh, we have that scheduled for April 19th and 20th, I believe. That's a Tuesday and a Wednesday, I think, um, in uh, 2016. I'm not quite sure if it'll be in Bethesda or if in, or in more, a more central part of the country. Uh, but we would hope that, that folks will put that on your calendars. And Eric, I know you love to come to Bethesda, so if we have it in Bethesda, you'll be there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if we hold it in Houston, you won't be there. <laughs> so, great. And, yeah, any other comments? Great. Thank you very much. Um, if not, then I'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker, if that's, if that's all right. Uh, 